Well, hello everyone, this is MD Wealth delivering you another kitchen quarantine tutorial during coronavirus. That almost is a tongue twister. Um, today we're gonna to be talking about exposure or as I like to call this particular setup, the worst example of tabletop photography ever. Actually, this particular look, this coffee mug setup here is, is done for a reason because what I wanna talk about is how to see where your image is being overexposed and knowing with a lot of accuracy where that exposure is and what the value of that exposure is. And you're gonna find in this video that a lot of the things that we depend on uh, as far as getting proper exposure in our camera uh, is not always as accurate as we want it to be. So what I've done here is I've taken a white mug and put it on a countertop in a relatively dark-ish kitchen. No kitchen lights are turned on and we have just a window light coming through that is pure bright white light. And I have set it, uh, my camera up on a tripod and if we cut over, you could see my crazy science experiment again here. We have all of our stuff tethered in. I'm even shooting USB, so we're tethered to the computer so we can see the images in real time. And I have another camera pointed at the back of this that we'll actually talk about why that is in a few minutes. So why am I doing this? Well, because there's a lot of different ways to get accurate exposure information. Uh, but maybe the best way, if it's available on your camera, is something called zebras. Uh, and we'll get into what zebras are, why they're important, why it should be something you should check and see if your camera has, and maybe something you should check and see on your next camera purchase. So let's start at back at the beginning. You have a couple of different ways on every digital camera to read your exposure levels, either when you shoot or after you shoot. In my case on my Sony system, I am in manual mode, 1 1 25th of a second, 2.0 on my aperture, ISO 400. And in between my aperture and my ISO is my metering information. And something we're going to see throughout this video is Sony does weird things when you plug into your HDMI on a uh, recorder. So uh, I don't get a metering bar, I get just a metering number. So 0.0, .0 or if you have a metering bar with the arrow right in the center is what the camera quote unquote thinks is a proper exposure. Now, if you've been photographing for a while, you probably know that the meter is not actually all that accurate. Uh, it also doesn't understand exactly what you're photographing. And in backlit situations like this is, and by the way, if you need to imagine my white mug is something far more attractive than a white mug, imagine a bride in a um, getting ready before a wedding and is backlit with the window. How do you know if the dress is being overexposed um, or if it's just the window light coming through? So this is a good example of that. So the meter right now tells us that this is a properly exposed image. And I think we could all agree, just looking at the LCD screen here, it doesn't look all that great. Now, if I come in and actually I take a photo and we come over to capture one as this is uh, getting ready to load, what you're going to find is that the mug is actually relatively dark. And I'm shooting both RAW and JPEG here, just so you could actually see the difference. But if I come over and I leave my, and I'm gonna leave my eyedropper right in this area right here for most of these images, the, the center of the mug, even though that it shouldn't be pure white, like 255, it is relatively dark, it's 149. If you look at the numbers at the top, it says 141, 150, 162. These are the RGB numbers. And then the brightness value is the far right hand one. Uh, brightness, pure white is 255, pure black is zero. And also we know that we have a color cast here because the red, green, and blue aren't even. Um, so red, green, and blue, pure white, if you're just looking at those values, it's 255 for all three as well. So we know that the meter is inaccurate. Now, there are ways around this. I could come in, I could switch my metering mode. I'm currently metering everything, which is multi in Sony speak, evaluative in Canon speak, and matrix in Nikon speak. And that means it's just looking at the entire scene and it's trying to average everything out. Well, it sees this bright window in the background and it thinks that it's a much brighter image. But what is our subject? It is this very plain looking mug. Now I could go into something called spot metering and most cameras, but not all cameras have spot metering. And now there's this small circle here that is actually telling me inside that circle what is actually the values here. Now, interestingly enough, a couple small things to point out. Most Canon cameras don't allow you to move the spot around. Uh, higher end Nikons do, uh, newer Sony cameras allow you to do this. And moving your spot uh, around tech, uh, and tying it to a single autofocus point is a great way to do this. But even when I, I put this on, say, the dark side of the mug, it tells me that I'm 0.7 underexposed. If I account for this, if I lower my shutter speed from 1 125 to, say, 180, 
right? Or 1 80th of a second. If I take a picture now, I mean, certainly this is a better exposure. It's definitely a brighter mug. And if for nothing more, uh, at this point of the video, you could understand that you probably should be using spot metering if you have difficult lighting situations over metering everything. And we could see there's a pretty radical difference here in the exposures, uh, and it's definitely a better exposure. But it still looks dark to me. Even with spot metering, the meter is giving me a dark image. And I have found, especially when I shot Canon, I've shot Nikon, I've shot Canon, and now I shoot Sony. But when I shot Canon especially, and even with Sony, I found that even if I did spot metering, more often than not, the camera was underexposing the images. So that was always something that I worried about. Now, there's nothing that's preventing you, and I'm gonna turn off my metering here, uh, go back to evaluative, so, so we could see how crazy this is gonna get. There's nothing stopping you if you're shooting in a mirrorless camera or you're shooting in live view to go into and turn on your histogram. Now your histogram is going to tell you your brightness, darkness levels, and it's gonna tell you whether or not you're over or underexposed. And if we look at this histogram, we could see we get a little sliver spike on the far right hand side. Now, experience probably tells us that it's the window, but is it just the window? Is it that little sliver of specular highlight on the mug as well? The histogram only tells you brightness value levels. It doesn't give you an actual location. Now I can take a picture and what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna push the histogram a little bit more and slide it over to the right, right? So that looks pretty good. And I'm gonna go ahead and take a picture. And by the way, look at the meter. The meter tells me I'm one full stop over. I'll take a picture and while this is loading, or transferring, I will look at it on the back of the camera and I do get highlight warnings. I do get those blinkies and it's telling me that this is actually overexposed, especially on the far side of the mug. Now, if I come into capture one and I go to the raw image and I put it over the relative same area here where we had before, I'll go to the JPEG. It, it's interesting, it, it, the blinkies tell me, oh, you're, you're overexposed but really I'm not, I'm at 241. I'm nowhere close to being overexposed. I have about 14, you know, brightness, you know, points essentially that I can still go to, to overexpose this. Now, small side note, why do you overexpose images? This is something called ETTR, not enough time to go into it in this particular video, but the simple bullet points of ETTR is the more you overexpose an image, because we could bring down the exposure in, the cam in camera editing software, the more you overexpose it, the less likelihood you are to have noise in your image. It's, a, it's an interesting concept, uh, and a lot of people are still getting used to it. But the problem with ETTR is overexposing as much as possible, but without losing detail. But here, the camera's telling me I'm overexposed, but when I go back home or I'm shooting tethered, it's telling me that I still have a lot of room to go if we come back over here to this particular camera angle. So this is where um, the zebras are gonna come into place. Now, here's the problem. I can't show you zebras on the recorder because Sony turns zebras off for whatever reason when you connect via HDMI. So this is where the second camera that I showed you earlier is gonna come into play. I'm right into the back of the camera and lo and behold, we have our zebras. Now, you can see the zebras here and you can see the overexposure happening. Now, zebras come from video camera world, old ENG news gathering cameras, you know, those live at five, big shoulder mounted cameras. This is a way that those operators knew whether or not they were overexposed. They would get this diagonal zebra pattern here. Now it is visually distracting, so it's good to set up a custom button to turn this on and off, and we'll get to that in a moment. But this is telling me right now that my window is overexposed, but I also see a little bit of zebra in on that specular highlight on the mug and on the very edge. Now, before we get too deep into zebras, how do you actually turn them on, turn them off, and what are their particular settings? First of all, I have a button set up where I can just simply hit it and turn the zebras on and off on my camera. So uh, this is really nice because, it, and I really highly recommend if you have the ability to do zebras, that you set it up as a custom button because you do not want to dive into a menu to go do this. But on the Sony system, if you're shooting Sony, uh, this is going to be found on most of the newer Sony cameras. So the Mark III, and probably the Mark III lineup and the Mark IV lineup are going to be found in the display auto review. This is the purple camera icon, page seven on my Mark IV. Now, a lot of people complain about Sony's menus. I'm not gonna sit here and defend Sony's menus to anybody, but I will say it does make sense that the zebra setting is in the video camera section because that's where this technology originates. You'd actually be surprised how much technology on your still camera 
is really video camera technology, but that's for another video as well. So with zebra settings here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this on and I'm gonna come into here. Now, first of all, you have two options as far as Sony goes. You could turn the zebras on or off here, which again, I would assign this functionality to a custom button, but then you could customize the actual level of the zebras here. And what's nice is you could actually get a preview and you could actually see what this is going to look like. Now, now we have this up and running. I do wanna take a moment to pause and explain where you're going to see this and where you're not going to see this. If you're shooting a DSLR that doesn't have live view, you don't have zebras. If you're shooting a DSLR that has live view and uh, it's a newer DSLR or a higher end DSLR, you may have zebras as an option in live view only. You're never gonna see this through the optical viewfinder. If you're shooting mirrorless, odds are that you have zebras on your camera. I know every Sony that I have shot and put my hands on seems to have zebras and just about every Olympus and Fuji that I've touched also has zebras as well. But double check your manual uh, and also double check your options because every camera system is gonna be a little bit different. Now, the basic levels of zebras are pretty simple. You can set when the zebras turn on at a brightness level. So I have 70 here, 75, 80, 85, all the way up to 100. And that will turn this on. And I'm actually going to set it to 100 and come back into the camera here. And I'm going to increase my exposure just a little bit and turn zebras on. There we go. And we could see the zebras come into here. Now, the problem with the just regular numbers is they only have a certain amount of range. So once you cross over, once you get really, really bright, the zebras will turn off, which in my opinion is not good. You wanna see everything that's overexposed. So watch what happens here. I'm gonna knock my, or increase my shutter speed, knock my exposure down quite a bit. So at 6400th of a second, you could see the zebras just come on in the window. But as I lower my shutter speed, increase the exposure, the zebras go away. You just get this little outline of them in there. And if you're just getting used to this, you could easily miss that. And all that's gonna happen, and I can't remember what my value is here, but whatever that value was that I hit for the menu, whenever it gets to that range, you'll see the zebras. But once you're over that, or once you're under that, the zebras go away. So I personally think that's not a great way to handle zebra levels, and I have it set to 100 here. Now, if you go to 100 plus, something interesting happens. It shows you anything that's 100 and over but it keeps all the zebras on. So the window stays on as well as the stuff that's starting to become overexposed. I really like this. And I think if you're shooting, if you're just getting into zebras and you're using this technology, I think it's well worth, uh, or I think this is probably a setting that you should go with because it's not overly complicated. You don't have to do any tests. And I'm gonna show you a test in a second. Now, Sony does give you an ability to customize this and they have a C1 or a C2, and they both have the exact same options, at least on the Mark IV system. Um, you have two types of zebras. Standard and range is exactly what we just saw with just the 100 or the 95. It only gives you the zebras in that particular range, and you could set the number, which we see here at 95, and then you could set the plus or minus value. And again, I think this is probably a bad way to approach zebras, because it's a way to easily miss something that's overexposed. The better option to me is lower limit, which is just kind of like that 100 plus that we saw, except now you could actually set that lower limit. Instead of 100 plus and what 100 plus actually means, who knows? You could come over to here and you could set the value to whatever you want. The highest you could go is 109. I have it currently set at 108. Uh, and I'll tell you why 108 in just one second, but you could set this value wherever you want to. Now, if you're gonna use lower limit and you're going to use this system, I highly advise you to do some testing here. And what I've done, or what I have found in playing around with this, is the easiest thing to do is bring in some sort of color checker or something that has those black to white swatches on there. So ideally in this particular color uh, checker from X-Rite, this passport, the pure, the white swatch should be pure white when it's properly illuminated. And the black swatch should be as close to black as you could get with a print. Now, why I use this is because this is a great way to figure out how high I can go and actually trust the overexposure. So if I come into here and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lower my exposure. I'm going to go back to 0.0, right? And actually, because there's this black object in here, now the meter is accounting for that. So uh, it's actually a little bit brighter than it was before. But this is kind of where we started. In fact, I'll pull this, I'll pull this away and let's just, there we go. Meters at 0.0, .0. now bring this back in. 
There we go. I'm just turning this into the light a little bit. That's why it's not straight on into camera, but that's fine. So 0.0, .0 we kind of know what we're going to get because we've already taken a photo there. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lower my shutter speed now, and I'm just going to wait for those zebras to pop up. So I'm going to come into here, and I'm just starting to see it at the edge. And then all of a sudden, I see that, that one white swatch at the very bottom, the one that's supposed to be pure white. And also, there's one in the upper left on the checker. They both have zebra patterns on there. I'm going to go ahead and take a picture, and then I'm going to... Uh, raise my shutter speed, I'm going to go to 1 so the zebras turn off and I'm going to take another picture. Now, while they're loading into Capture One, if I do an image review here, and of course everything's taking a while, there we go, back to image review, we can see that we get the blinkies in both images, right? So we're seeing overexposure in both images. The histograms are just ever so slightly different, but not radically different. But if we come back over to Capture One here and we take a look at this, so this was the image that we shot with, it was overexposed. And if I put my eyedropper right on that white swatch, if we look at those numbers now, it's 253, 254, 255. So very close to being balanced as well because we're bringing the light values up. So we're getting closer to balanced colors as well. Dark colors sometimes get an unbalanced kind of look or shaded colors. So that's close, but also the value right there is 254. Now, if I go to my raw image that I shot, at the uh, lower level, just underneath that, just below that, before the, the bright, the, right before the zebra's turned on, so this is 1 30th of a second, right? This is 250. So what's interesting about this is by having the zebra set on my camera at 108, I can now know exactly right when I'm being, or, or I'm hitting that overexposure. And even though 109 is the top level, I have found that 108 is just that one step lower. So all of a sudden I see that light up, I know I'm right there, and I just drop one of my exposure values ever so slightly. And it's not even a third of a stop. It's gonna be like a 10th of a stop. It's very subtle, but then you could just go down maybe just a little bit on shutter speed. I mean, increase your shutter speed a little bit. Uh, probably a change in aperture or ISO is gonna be way too much, but you could just kind of fine tune that. Now, the benefit of this is, and I'll go ahead and pull this checker away and take one last photo here. The benefit of this is, even though we see all those zebras there, when we come back into the mug and we take a look at this actual final image here in the raw, right? Everything that was overexposed, waiting for capture one to catch up. There we go. Undo my white balance. So look, even everything that's overexposed, it's 249, it's 250, 238, 240 over here, but it is a much brighter image than we had when we started off at the very beginning, which was uh, this look here on the camera of the meter telling us that we actually had a proper exposure. So I'll, I'm trying to turn on my five stars, there we go. So this is what the camera originally thought, good old fashioned meter technology, expensive lens, expensive camera, that's what the meter thought was properly exposed. This is using zebras. Now is this overexposed? Yeah, but I can lower this down, bring that histogram back, and if, it's, and, and if you're not really into that, that's fine. You could at least set it to like 100 and then dial things down. You don't have to push the exposure as much, but I know exactly what's being overexposed. I know the location of it. I don't have to look at my meter as much. I don't have to look at the histogram, and I don't have to review, and I don't have to look at those blinkies, and this could be a huge time saver. So again, to wrap things up, this is gonna be available on most mirrorless cameras. Double check your manuals on that. If you're shooting a DSLR, you have to have the ability to do live view, but uh, if you have live view, double check, you might have zebras available. If you do, I highly recommend, especially if you're trying to dial things in, it works out really well. Mirrorless shooters, especially if you're shooting backlit subjects or weddings, this is gonna be something because you can look right through the uh, viewfinder when you're doing your focusing, your exposure, you're gonna know exactly where your overexposure is at. It's gonna save you a lot of time and effort. It's gonna also make things a little bit easier in post-production as well. So this wraps things up. I'm really interested uh, to read the comments, see uh, what you liked and didn't like about this video. Also, maybe future requests for more quarantine kitchen tutorials. I hope you're healthy. I hope your friends and your family are healthy as well. I wish you all the best. Take care.